I'm here today to talk about this new guide which we're currently writing at ASHRAE. We're hoping to publish it next year. We've been working on it for about three or four years. And um, this guide is, is different to the one which we've already published, which is the Hot and Humid uh, Design Guide. And you've probably seen that one. It's for countries, uh, particularly uh, on the eastern side of the United States, where they have high humidity. So that's, that's a problem. Um, so that guide's available and you can purchase that from Axel if you wish. This, this guide's not yet available um, and I'm looking more at the hot and dry climate. Um, so today I'd like to treat it as a little bit as a workshop in fact. If you've got any ideas, you know, please come forward and give them to me. Um, I've also been asked by Ashley to put this forward as a, a short course. So a uh, short course at Ashley is normally half a day. Obviously today we just got probably an hour and a half, um, but uh, I, I'll do that short course as well, which will be based on the design guide, um, and that will cover things like the kind of strategy you might have for cooling in a hot climate, what kind of engineering systems, um, identify how much uh, des of the design could rely on passive measures, you know, natural ventilation, thermal storage, solid materials, uh, and where we need mechanical systems to do the cooling. And, how those two systems might um, work together in a hybrid way, or to describe the energy use patterns of buildings and apartments. And the other really big issue at the moment is how we might do this in a net zero carbon way. We say net zero energy, of course, but what we mean is net zero carbon. So we might use renewable energies. Um, and the other thing that's come up, and I'll mention this again later, is how we might make uh, external areas cool or comfortable anyway. So we're not, we're not going to outside air condition. <laughs> that would be ridiculous. But what can we do to make it more comfortable outside, uh, around our buildings and people? Um, I've got to acknowledge the fact that we have a, a committee here at ASHRAE. And if any of you want to join that committee, by the way, you can do. Uh, because in the ASHRAE, we have um, the committee that meets. But we also have corresponding members. So you would be on an email list, and you'd get uh, information on what we're doing. Um, and then we report to the Publications Committee who will publish this guide. Um, I've set up a UK Northern section and there's people helping me there. And I've had a lot of really good input from um, ASHRAE chapters around the world and particularly in this region. Um, so today I want to talk about the aims of the guide, um, how it fits in with other ASHRAE publications. So as you know, with any guide like this, we, we don't want to explain how to do everything because it already might exist in, in another, in the handbooks, for example, the applications handbooks or the psychometrics handbooks. That's where we would normally go to find out how to do particular calculations. So what the guide does is really pull that together into how we're going to do that for hot climates. Um, I want to identify what else is available so people will have a look at other good information. Um, and I want it to be kind of better, you know, the target of ours, I think, to make this guide really better than other guides and hopefully we can do that. Uh, and what I really want to bring in is passive design, and then passive solar design, that's the other way we use that expression, uh, thermal storage, uh, daylight, which I think is quite lacking at ASHRAE at the moment. The uh, North Americans in particular like to have a building which is fully mechanical, winter and summer, um, and actually there's a, there's a lot of opportunity there to use a passive design as well, incorporating that. And I'll, show an example later. Uh, we've obviously got to talk about air conditioning systems and equipment because we will need those, um, but we might want to do them in a hybrid way. So we might want to build in that we can naturally ventilate sometimes and mechanically cool other times. And we would do that because that's obviously going to be a lot cheaper to run. We can save money. Um, and I'm in the guide includes some case studies uh, and some uh, example calculations. Um, so in terms of the contents, this is how we came up with this at first. Uh, this is based on sort of other guides, the sort of topics we would cover. But I did adapt later on and we changed it. I want to put in these kind of case studies. This is uh, the, the bullet building in Seattle, which is a, a net zero energy building in, in, a, in a hot climate. But Seattle is also cool in the, in the evenings. Um, this is a building I've done in Blackpool here. Uh, this is a building in La Jolla in California, uh, and that's, this is a, a scheme in um, Hawaii. So we can get some 
fairly interesting case studies here to show people. This one is uh, a bit closer to us in Dubai, and uh, DWA, that's the Dubai Electricity and Water Authority, uh, they're actually building what they say is going to be the tallest, largest, and smartest the net zero energy building in the world, um, due for completion this year, actually. So th this is some information. I've got some of that coming back to me to put into this, into this uh, document, which I think will be useful. I've got a number of methods around, they've been around for a while actually, but I don't think people are too aware of them. And I, I think one of the problems with our industry, particularly in the UK, um, is there's a big gap between the people doing the research and uh, people in education who might be coming up with new methods of doing things, and the, the applications people who are usually 10, maybe 20 years behind. But this was work done at Cambridge University called the LT method, which is lighting the thermal. And it really looks at how you can make your building more effective if you pick the right fabric, the right windows, orientation, really look at how the building is working. Uh, and this was really done uh, under an EU directorate uh, a few years ago now, and it uh, wasn't really at the stage when we were doing a lot of simulation work. So a lot of the uh, information in this method with the energy design tool is really simple to use. It's just some graphs. And, so this is kind of first stage tool where you could come back to the architect and work with the architect to really come up with the right kind of building. And let me say, we're not great at that in the UK. You know, usually the architect does something, comes to us with it, and say, oh, that doesn't look too good. And there's a, almost an argument starts. Whereas we, we really talked about working together to come up with an integrated design. So this gives the engineer and the architect, I guess, um, some checklists and tables which would help them come up with the most effective building. And in the period of passive solar design, which was really, I think, in the 80s and 90s, um, there was quite a lot of funding, actually, from Europe uh, and in the UK for research in this way. We did come up with some fantastic schemes. This is Dragvold University in, in Denmark with an atrium which really improved the efficiency of that building, but it also encouraged natural ventilation, uh, and that's an effective solution. This is a, uh, the John Darling Mall, which is in Oxford, and again, an atrium roof with a, a space below there that's very uh, attractive and comfortable. You know, how does that work? Um, and how can we use that in other buildings? The other one I'm going to mention uh, a bit later on, and I won't get into too much detail, but I'm going to use it in the, hand, in the guide, is this Handbook of Tropical Housing and Building Design. Uh, I don't know if any of you have come across this, but this is a really interesting method of looking at how to design buildings in, in tropical areas, um, looking at the, um, the climate and the kind of materials it might use. And it has this series of indicators known as the Mahoney Tables here. This is, a, this is a name, obviously, Mahoney Tables. And I'll show you some of those later on. Um, and it looks at how you might lay the building out, how you might space buildings, what kind of air movement you're going to get into the building, and the other things you'd want, walls, roofs, rain protection. And, and then, obviously, after that, start to look at the systems. So this uh, is a fairly systematic approach, which I've found to work quite well. Um, a project I've done, which is works extremely well is Coventry University Library. Um, this is a 10,000 square meter building on four stories in the UK. It's completely naturally ventilated. Um, and I just mentioned here, this is the Sibsey AM10 guide, which uh, if you're a Sibsey member, you can download that for free. But if you're not, you can purchase it through ASHRAE or Sibsey. Uh, but that's really a, a, an excellent handbook on how to design a naturally ventilated building. So, so this particular building is interesting because it's on the four floors. It has five atriums in it. There's one of them there. Um, it has um, windows around the perimeter, and none of those windows open. So I'm, I'm saying that now because I want to say to you that natural ventilation does not necessarily mean the windows open. It, it could do. I mean, we could open the windows there and let the area if we want. But there are other ways of doing it. And the reasons we might want to do it another way is because we can control the openings better. So if, for example, in this room, we decide to have natural ventilation, but those windows were locked 
or maybe they never open, maybe they're just a piece of glass, uh, we could underneath the window put an inlet with a damper, with a controller, so we can measure the temperature in the room here, and that damper would open and close to let more or less air in. This controller could also measure the CO2 in the room, and it could decide we need some more fresh air, so it could open the damper for other reasons. It might be there's a fire in the building, and we think, oh, it would be good to have smoke ventilation. So the, these openings can be controlled to do whatever we want. And so they could be in the wall, under the window, they could be in chimneys that are dropping. Uh, in this case, they're in a plenum under the building. So right down at ground level, there's a complete floor which is unoccupied. It's, it sits into the ground. And of course, the benefit of that is that air is cool, because the ground is cool. And so that air is, comes in through these atrium spaces, and it comes up across to the perimeter, and then goes up through the chimneys on the edge of the building. Uh, there are 20 chimneys. So the whole thing is completely controlled automatically controlled all the time. And that um, building is the lowest energy building in the UK, that particular building. Now, looking at natural ventilation as a strategy, it's obviously something we can do fairly well in, in Europe because we have the climate where it, it, it can work for uh, a lot of the year. It may not work in the peak of summer, but if we... Um, well, as a matter of fact, I did a, an analysis of a building in just outside Dubai in Sharjah. It was the, the American University, actually, in Sharjah. Uh, and I came back and said, well, actually, you can naturally ventilate this for six months. It'd be perfectly comfortable. And if for six months it won't work, you'll have to put the air conditioning on. So, you know, straight away, you're halving the energy bill. Um, so natural ventilation can work pretty well. Now, to extend that, you can also link it with thermal storage. And, and this particular building in the, in the UK, which is a big school here on four levels, um, we developed systems to naturally vent the whole of that building using this central section as an atrium street. So the air is pulled into the building through inlets and windows, goes into the centre, and, and then this big atrium is basically like a big chimney that pulls the air through the building. And it's all completely automatically controlled. Uh, I also, that building, looked at thermal storage cooling because what you can do is cool the structure down at night so that your concrete slabs are nice and cool and then the next day when the heat is built up in the room the building starts to absorb that heat the concrete in the building absorbs that heat and uh, as I say, you can use the slab I mean the concrete slab, you can use that or you can use phase change material, which uh, we did. We, we put phase change material in. So I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. But if you're going to use a slab, you're not going to do that. If you're going to use a slab, you need to tell the architect and the structural engineer how big you want the slab to be. So it might sound unusual here, but here's us air conditioning engineers telling the structural guy the slab has to be six inches or 150 millimeter or 200 millimeter and it has to be a particular dense concrete otherwise it won't absorb the heat so the structural engineer might decide the slab is 150 say and it can be lightweight concrete you come back and say no it has to be 200 and it has to be heavyweight concrete because we're going to do this and that, that's really what we did on that commentary library building actually because the building is a big thermal store and, and they're okay with that structure engineers. Once they understand what you're doing, they'll, they'll do it. Um, so you're really trying to make the building more stable. And of course, as you go around the world now, and particularly, I guess, in America, some of these buildings you go to, they're really lightweight. You know, as you walk along, you can feel the floor bouncing. You think, oh, there's not much structure there. Well, there isn't, you know, maybe it doesn't have to be. But if we want the building to form, as a thermal store, we need to make sure we have enough, let's say, concrete in the system. And I guess if you go around some of the old historic buildings here in Athens, or anywhere in the world, you'll, you'll find they're big, solid stone buildings, and they're cool. And in winter, they're warm, because they store energy. So the other thing here with the phase change material is where we do have a lightweight construction, we can put phase change in instead. So, so the idea of the slab absorbing the cooling is that we might have a full ceiling, 
we pull the air up over the ceiling and, and, it, and it drops back down. We might have some fans in here, fan coil units or something to circulate the air. But when it gets up here, this concrete slab is taking the heat out and keeping the room cool. Um, and in this particular example, we've combined it with some phase change material in the ceiling there, which is a, a material that absorbs heat and changes uh, phase from solid to liquid as it does so. And as you know, uh, when, you, when you do that, it, uh, it changes phase at a set temperature. It doesn't, you know, with concrete, it will gradually heat up. With phase change, it's absolutely flat and steady until it changes into liquid and then it will start to warm up. So the phase change material uh, that you have has a freeze point which you can pick. So this phase change material here, this white stuff, comes in blocks, in plastic blocks. It's sealed, completely sealed. It's, it's completely inactive. There's no electricity supply, nothing like that. It's just a block. And uh, it's full of the material that changes phase and the temperature that you define. So on the project I did, I figured that if we want to keep the room comfortable at 21, 22, maybe 23, I want to phase change at 24 or 25. So the air going up, when it got to 24 or 25 in the ceiling, it cooled down again and, and dropped back into the space. And, and so we were able to keep the temperature of the room in summer uh, below 25. So, of course, when all that material has changed into liquid, and it's not, not dripping, of course, it's in this box, um, when it's all changed, then you've lost that capacity. So you have to decide how much heat you've got in the room and how long it will take all this to change from phase, uh, solid to liquid phase, which um, I was doing a big uh, college, an educational building, and I figured we wanted eight hours, so that was my calculation. Uh, and this is it, this is the project. Um, this is the, uh, the study area in the college the, where the students sit here. Um, and this is looking, uh, this, is the, this is the room actually. This is looking into the full ceiling. Now here's the full ceiling. So the full ceiling has uh, flat tiles, it's got lights. It's also got these open grid tiles, you know, like a, they call it a Luxalon tile or whatever. So the air can go up into the ceiling it can circulate and then it can drop back down again. And when it gets into the ceiling, you'll see that it has these big tubes which are mounted on this metal gantry. And, the, and these tubes, the air comes up, drops back down cool, they absorb all this heat and they keep the room cool. So, you think, why would you do that? So, in this situation, I was working for a big, big contractor on this project. It was a 30 million pound building, and um, we designed it to be naturally ventilated. So we had enough air coming through to keep these rooms cool. Um, somewhere along the line, he changed the windows, and he only had one window that would open. So he said, "Will this work?" I said, "No, it won't work. You know, that's not going to work. That <laughs> we need uh, all the windows that I told you." We wanted otherwise it's not going to work so oh what can we do i said well, we have to air conditioning we have to put a big package on the roof with a chiller and we'll circulate cool air and everyone will be comfortable and there was more than one room actually this is one room but there were more than one room so we wanted um a, a big chiller 100 kilowatts we wanted 100 kilowatts more electricity which he didn't have and he wanted this big equipment on the roof and the roof wasn't very strong it was a flat roof that wouldn't take any equipment. And another thing this contractor had decided is that no one would ever go on the roof. There was nothing on the roof to go up there for. So unless the roof was leaking, you would never go on the roof. Now that, that's a big cost thing because there's no lighting up there, no edge protection, nothing like that because it's just a roof. So as soon as we put something on the roof, then he's, he's got edge protection on, lights, staircase, so he said, is there anything else you could do? And I said, well, yeah, this is an innovative idea. No one's done it before, but we can try it. And it's one of those situations as an engineer, you think, well, I, I think I've got a solution here that will work. I'm not entirely sure, but I'm pretty confident, but it's gonna save a lot of money. And it, if it works, it's gonna be great. So we did it. Um, I was able to spend the money, because this isn't cheap either. I had to buy this stuff, but I had to buy all these, uh, Phase change materials, with the, the stuff comes from China. Um, it's in sealed tubes, 
it, unless it will last forever, we, because we think you, you're you're always um, melting and then refreezing this stuff. It's probably got a twenty-year cycle, and then you might have to replace it. That's the same as a chiller. So we did it. We put it in the rooms, all the rooms that were necessary, and it's worked great. It's fantastic. It, it does work. So I call it free air conditioning. Um, it works great because at night we flush these rooms with cool air and they refreeze and the next day they take uh, seven or eight hours in hot weather obviously to uh, re-melt. So there's an example of uh, phase change material cooling in, in a classroom situation. <clears throat> the biggest room I did was a seven hour room that had 120 people in it so it's quite a big load. Um, <clears throat> this is another example, um, and I, I know this is a humid climate as well here, but it's the same for hot and dry. This particular example, it, it's a big college in uh, Chicago. Now, I did this scheme with the architect um, who, who did Coventry University Library that we saw earlier, that big library, four-story library in the atrium. And, and uh, this particular college were interested in doing something similar in Chicago you know, a low energy, environmentally friendly building. And it's about the same height, four or five stories. So we were going to see whether this approach would actually work in this climate. And essentially, could we naturally ventilate this building? Uh, and I've, I've only got a few slides of this, but I'll put the example in the, in the guide uh, to show how we did it. But one of the things to look at is the depth of this wall. So these windows, these are window reveals here. Now that's, that's good because you're shading the windows, obviously, but you're still allowing the light in, because you want light. Um, but this depth of wall is also the chimney. These are chimneys here behind these panels to allow air to come in into the spaces and then also up to the roof and vent out of the roof. So um, I think you'll see here from this shot um, uh, how the windows fit in and how the space between the windows is actually chimneys. Cause this is before the wall was put on. And then this is the roof space with these chimneys. I have to say, in all this stuff, by the way, these chimneys are very much an architectural expression. We, we as engineers, in my opinion, don't need any of these old shapes. We just need a hole. But, you know, it's going to be sealed off and weatherproof. And the architect always likes to make a feature of it. Great, you know. That's fine, as long as it works. <clears throat> but what we want to do is something that allows the air out, has a damper in there that can open or close, because we don't want it open all the time, we want to close it, and we might want to modulate that damper because we're trying to control the amount of air flushing through the building. But that's, that's an illustration of what it looks like uh, on that, say, double facade. Uh, and this is a diagram of the ventilation strategy. So this is really how it works. And, and I'm going to explain how it works in winter and summer here. And you've got to remember, Chicago is a place where it gets really cold in winter, like minus 20, minus 30 degrees centigrade. In summer, uh, plus 40 degrees centigrade, so and humid as well. So what happens is the air comes into the lower level, where, into this big plenum area, which is kind of <coughs> sunk into the ground. So it's, um, it, it's, gra it's ground linking, really. So we've got this uh, thermal storage I've talked about before with the ground cooling the air. And it comes in through a large um, louver with a battery behind it, which will have a controlled amount of air coming in. Um, <clears throat> and then it comes into the atrium spaces where it flows up and it enters each floor level at low level. So we take this level here, it goes into this level of the building, um, and as it wakes its way through, of course, it gets warmer. And when it gets to the edge here, it goes into this chimney where it goes up to the roof and then out through this outlet. And it's, uh, I don't know if you see the numbers here, but it's saying it'd be 27 degrees C by the time it gets here. So it's coming in at um, 17 degrees C into the space. The space is adding heat. The heat is the lights, people, equipment. Um, and then that airflow, having reached 27, flows up and outside the space there. So the atriums are part of the uh, ductwork, if you like, part of the ventilation system. Uh, we have this plenum here as part of the ventilation and these outside chimneys up to the roof. They're all part of the system. Now, in, in Chicago, this wouldn't work in summer. So what we've done 
it's not on this diagram, I'm afraid, but we've taken the air in through a, a wall and in through a large air handling plant. And in summer, that air comes in, it's cooled, it's dehumidified as well, dried, and then it's re-released back into this space. And then it carries on before doing what it did before. So the, the big difference is that in the in Chicago environment, and this will apply anywhere, of course, you can put a big air handling kit in here to take the outside air and bring it down to the condition you want. Put it cooler, put it drier, and then you can then use your natural ventilation strategy to let it flow around the building. And that, that works fine. Well, that one has worked fine. <laughs> Uh, this That's is a question. picture of the atrium, and you can see the low-level inlets that I'm talking about. Um, the exhaust from the chimneys on the far side. Excuse me, may I ask a question? In that case, in summer, don't you recirculate any of the air? That means that you, uh, you, 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 can, you, you can do. You can do. You can do, and they, they do do that. You don't have to. You could let it flush but through. If the, air, if the outside air is warm and humid, that yeah. means that running 100% uh, fresh air through the building and uh, through the, the air and there consumes a lot of energy. No, they, they do they do bring some of that air back down and back through the plant at low level. So you're right, you, you do have the option of recirculating some air in summer. Because they say you've already dried it, mm -hmm. uh, you've already yeah. cooled it. So if, if it reaches the roof and it's 27, 28, and it's 40 outside, right. then you're right, you, you'd be better off recirculating some air mix some fresh air in, and so your control system would do that for you. So, good luck. Glad you reminded me, but you're quite right. You could, should always recirculate, you know, as and when. And of course, if you're cooling the building in the morning, there's no one in there, you could just recirculate completely, just to keep it, get it under the right temperature. Um, so that's a picture of the building. It's about, if you ever get to Chicago, it's about 20 miles outside, and then they'd be pleased to show you around. It's a, it's a university. These are the uh, exhausts. Uh, I don't use really think I, I think they're a bit odd shaped, but uh, that's the architect's decision. Uh, from an engineer's point of view, they work, so that's fine. And this, this is, uh, I think, one of the diagrams that really says it all. This is uh, Judson College here. This is a standard U.S. Uh, university building, um, and this one is as well. So just for comparison purposes. I have to say I'm not sure what standard 24, 20, 26 are. I don't know the, those new terms, but um, comparing them, you can see that uh, the heating is pretty similar. That's a winter situation. The cooling, there's certainly some cooling, but it's less than that and that. And the fan energy <coughs> is less as well. And, and you could almost say um, a lot of that's because in the winter, they're not working, you know. Um, but in the summer, yeah, perhaps you, you bring that unit on. So if you do look at the Chicago climate, you, you'll find that hot humid period is about three months. You've got nine months where you, you're just naturally ventilating and heating. So that's really um, quite similar, in fact, to what we found in the UK at Coventry University Library. Uh, and I, I'm told there are technical papers on this which I'll also reference in the guide that this is the lowest energy uh, educational building in the, in the US. Um, this architect, um, Alan Shaw, his name is, he's very keen on natural ventilation. Um, he's, he's now a professor of architecture at Cambridge University. So uh, had, had somebody, and it helps to have somebody who really wants to do it. Um, uh, moving on, I think the other big impetus in this guide has got to be looking at net zero because that's coming on us really fast. So, I, I know it's, well, Greece is part of Europe and this region is Europe and as you know, these are our targets, aren't they? We've all got to be net zero fairly soon, certainly with you, Bill. Um, <clears throat> the US has done quite a bit as well. These are reports um, coming out of the US from the New Building Institute in 2012 and it's got the zero energy buildings already constructed in the United States. You can see there's, there's quite a few around. Um, <coughs> so the, the really so done all the new builds in those uh, areas of No, US. not all the new builds. These are one-offs. These are big ones. Just tried one. All right. Yeah, sorry. It's one off. Yeah. In each state. Or in yeah. Okay. Uh, not every state. Uh, California's keen. Um, okay. 
Yeah, the states that are in, in red. In red, yes. Oh, yeah. uh, some, so some at least one though building in state yeah. in red. Uh, yes, that's right. Net zero, net zero energy or nearly zero energy or net carbon? Carbon, yeah, carbon. net zero carbon, yeah. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll feature some of those in the guide. Um, uh, so, some of them have cost more money than they would have done, some not. I, I think without going into the politics of the US, um, some states are very keen, California is very keen to be low carbon and they've set some pretty onerous targets. Other states don't care. I think particularly in the middle here they use a lot of Nebraska and these places use a lot of coal. I, I did a presentation in uh, Omaha uh, University where Tim Wentz, remember our president Tim Wentz a couple of years ago I did a presentation for him and uh, to his students. And he, and he said to the students, we, why don't we do this? And a bit of a dunno. He said, well, the electricity is only six cents <laughs> because it's a coal power station down the road. And so that's one of the, the problems, I guess, if you've got a big coal plant. Um, and the other thing you should understand about the US is they don't have a, a big grid like us. They're, they're not all connected up to the same grid. So because there's big areas here, the desert and things, so they don't want to run big cables for miles. They tend to have local energy systems, some of them have coal, some, some of them don't. In California, I mean, California had a <clears throat> really big problem with energy. Uh, you know, after the Enron scandal and that kind of thing, they, um, they really tried to look at how they can make their energy systems more effective and efficient. And they've gone for PVs in a big way. So if you, if you do go out, they've got massive PV farms there. Uh, I, I'm surprised in the UK, we, we've got a well, this grid carbon thing on here, I'll show you what it's interesting today, so you can see how much carbon we're producing on our grid at any given time. And that, at times, we're 50% we're renewables, but that's with the wind turbines that they've been putting up in there. So for any given area, it depends what your, <coughs> what your renewable is. <laughs> I, guess, I guess here in Greece, you have quite a lot of uh, PV, which is more effective than it is in the UK. But in the UK, we're sat in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, or an island, and it's wind. So yeah, I mean, <coughs> zero energy can work, I think. Um, just we need some people to believe us engineers. <laughs> give, us, give us the tools, give us the money, we can do it. <coughs> so when we looked at the guide, this was, uh, again, uh, the kind of things we were talking about with, with cooling system options and the type of controls for cooling uh, and these case studies. Um, let me think of it before. Um, so, so one of the questions to you today is, having said that, so, what do you want to see? Is there anything else I should add? Let me know. Um, what, what about how, how to write it? I don't think it should be like a book. I think it should be like a guide with tables and lists. If you want to help, very well. Just let me know if you've got a, a case study or something that you think could go in here. Just send it over. <coughs> um, in terms of the scope, I think we've got to put the basic stuff in for people. You know what. Uh, you know, must you know? I, I like the idea of putting in some <coughs> worked examples. Sibsi does that in the guide. If you look at the um, natural ventilation guide, for example, it, it gives an example calculation. And it, <coughs> it's always helped me. You know, for this particular application, this is how to work out the inlets and outlet. Oh, great, you know. Uh, so mine might be different from that, but at least I can see how the calculation works. So I want to do that. Uh, the low carbon, this was uh, Qatar uh, coming up in 2020 with the World Cup, you know, <clears throat> could we help them? And I have been there and presented to them and they're, they're quite keen on this. Um, of, co of course, they, <laughs> they've now done the obvious thing and switched the World Cup to the winter, which is, you know, a good thing to do. Um, and, and how are we going to make sure that this, this is future-proof when the oil and the gas run out? Uh, and on that, by the way, our UK gas that we own runs out in two years' time. So we're at the end of the era of gas, I think, whether we like it or not. <laughs> um, we're buying gas, by the way, from Australia and Qatar and places, which, which sounds great until you realise there's a lot of money going that way. <laughs> um, OK, so, so the guide contents I mentioned is the, the big new one that came in was external areas. When I went to Qatar, they said to me, how do we keep the outside cool? The people who come from the World Cup and sit outside with a beer. I'm assuming they're going to let us have a drink. 
um, how can we make sure people are comfortable? And I thought, well, it, never, it never crossed my mind that we should be cooling outside. But then when I looked at it, I thought, yeah, um, that would be quite easy to do uh, and free. It should be free, by the way, um, but we just don't do it properly. And if you start to have a look around, <coughs> you can see how people get this wrong. So the, the first thing I notice in Qatar, they've got a lot of these big, tall buildings, 50, 60 storey high in the Doha, um, and the ventilation like anything else is on the roof. I'm thinking, why are they not dumping the air at low level? If you've air conditioned this 50 storey building and you're about to throw away air, which is, coming back to your point, <laughs> it's 26 degrees centigrade maybe, why not show it out at ground level? What's it going to do? It's going to hang around, it's heavy. 26 is heavy when you're in a place where the summertime temperature is 35 to 40. And it's got to, it's got to pick up heat before it's going to go up. So if you just put it outside the, the building, it'll just flow around until it gets warm and then it'll go upwards. So that would be one simple way. But I, I've got these things covered now with, with shading and other things like that. I, I'm not, of course, trying to avoid air conditioning because I think we do need it. And, and these are the kind of buildings we get in these days and they're going to be air conditioned. So maybe as I said before, the, the cooling that's been done in this building is dumped at low level, uh, and then it has a, a sort of second purpose. Uh, I've got a couple of slides here on net zero. I don't want to bore you with this, but I thought it might be worth looking at this because uh, there's, there's a lot going on in the UK, uh, I suppose, in political terms. This is Manchester doing a Green Summit pledge, uh, and they said they want to be net zero by 2040. Uh, the, the UK government apparently is the only government in the world that's signed up to be net zero by 2050. Um, having said that, they, they sign a lot of stuff and don't do it. So that's the other problem. But uh, the Tyndall Centre is based in Manchester, and it's after John Tyndall. Um, and they really say in that if we don't do this stuff, um, we will have you know, major problems in the planet. So I'm not sure how aware of all this, but I was I'm going to touch on it in the guide in the sustainability section as to why this should be important. Because if we don't do it, they're talking about uh, you know sea levels rising. Um, so that, that's actually Miami with a three degree sea rise. Uh, it's it's underwater basically, and there's quite a few. Um, that, that's probably the worst city in the U.S. There's quite a, a few other cities like New York and, and London, of course, where, which where there would be flooding. Liverpool would be flooded. Um, so we're going to get coastal flooding at one point five, and we're already seeing some of that. Um, but I, I began to get my head into this and understand what was going on. I got this chap over from America, his, his name's uh, John Englander. He's an oceanographer and this is him at the uh, Royal Institution in London. And he, he, this is his book, um, which you can download. Um, and he's standing at the lecture theatre where John Tyndall stood when he said at the start of the Industrial Revolution all this coal burning is going to affect the planet. So this was uh, in the 1760s or whatever it was, you know, so 200 years ago. So um, that was all predicted, and uh, he was kind of keen to come and do this. So I took him around the UK and I took him to Liverpool and he gave some talks. But we're already seeing this kind of problem. This is a, a railway line, the sea levels have come up. And as he said, with, with sea level rise, it's, it's, a, it's a steady thing. But of course, the sea level comes up and down twice a day, you know, high tide and low tide. Um, and then we've got our storm surges and wind surges and things like that. So what you're going to get is not you know, just one steady problem, but you're going to get bigger, more serious um, weather effects, like these railway coming off here. They're going to build another railway now in this, in this area because the weather's got worse. And we're seeing that around the world. Uh, and then there are all these research studies going on, if you want to look for them. Uh, integrated model to assess the global environment in the Netherlands. Uh, so that, they, they pick these letters to form a word, it's called image, and it's looking at the ecological impacts of carbon. Um, this is Ramsey's Reconciling Adaptation, Mitigation, and Sustainable Development for Cities. So it's looking at you know, how London is going to adapt with this climate change, how Granada in Spain might adapt, you know, which, which cities are going to survive basically and which aren't if things get uh, as bad as they might get. 
Um, <clears throat> and, and what about transforming the UK energy system? Uh, so I've done this study on what the public are going to think about it. Because we are changing quite a lot. You know, the big old thermal power stations, they're disappearing um, because we're going to renewables with wind turbines and PV and we've got more local generation. Uh, that, that can give you a, a, an unstable grid if you're not careful. Um, so how did the public feel about that? So as a result of that, Manchester came up with this idea of zero by 2040 and they set their own strategy up for doing this. Um, and I think what we do have to understand is this means net zero carbon, not, not bits and pieces. So the, the UK building regs and the EU directive on energy performance in buildings it is actually only covering these things. It, it doesn't cover the plug loads, which, you know, computers and all that stuff. Uh, and it doesn't cover process loads. So they're outside of our construction definition of zero at the moment. But these other <coughs> net zero targets we're talking about, they, they're everything. Um, so if you take a hospital, and I'm, I'm working on the uh, net zero hospital guide at the moment with Ashray, it includes all the uh, imaging machinery and the radiotherapy machinery, everything. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. So, uh, and again, again, for society, it also goes beyond our buildings and covers all these, these other things here. So it's a big, it's a big ask. Um, we're, we're not really involved in this stuff here. We're talking about the buildings bit, that's what we do. Uh, and I say, there's a lot happening already. We've got these um, design guides, you've probably seen them. Um, I haven't got a picture up here, but so you can download them for free. Do you all know that, by the way? Uh, you don't have to be an ASHRAE memory, but you just go on the ASHRAE website and look for the advanced energy design guides, and you can download them for free. All right? When we talk about these buildings, we're trying to make the building lean and make an efficient building to start with, be clean so that the systems in it are, are efficient. The, the heating system, the cooling system, the ventilation, they're actually very efficient. And we've got some really great advances in that now. And then be green so at the end we will want to put on some renewable energy, some green energy, PV or wind or whatever we're going to do. Um, to get our net zero. The case studies I mentioned before, I'll just move on to this. Th this is a, a picture in Granada actually, but um, this is one of the problems I think, and, and we, we're, although we're mechanical engineers, um, what to do with ventilation, we need to point this out to people, that when you've got a building that's surrounded by concrete, the air that's coming into the building, and this isn't just the windows, of course, it could be the ventilation plant, isn't going to be at the outside temperature on your climate data, it's going to be way higher because this uh, hard core is, is heating it up. So I, I don't know how much temperature you, you'd expect that to be, but I suppose if you think of Athens here, uh, and you're walking through Athens in the summer, how much hotter is it on the street of Athens than it would be out? In the countryside, five C, seven sometimes. Five or seven degrees C, you see. So, if you've got the weather data for Athens, you think, oh, the summertime temperatures are going to be like uh, 32, and you design the air handling plant for that. It's not. It's going to be 39. Yeah. You know. And if you've done your natural ventilation, you think I'll open the window, the air will come in at 32. No, it's not. It's 39. So how can you make it 32? Well, you could if you had more planting around here and greenery and maybe the cars were over out the way. But it, I, I really saw that, I went to Changi Hospital in Singapore, and that's a naturally ventilated hospital, and said it wasn't working, so I had a look, and I could see why it wouldn't work. I mean, there, was, there was a lot wrong with the way the building had been constructed, but the, the obvious thing was looking out the window, was it was concrete and there was lots of cars parked. So, so cars actually get hotter than concrete. <laughs> Uh, this, this roof on, on the summer, when you touch it, you're going to burn your hand, you know, so that's in the 40s or 50s. So that's the air that's coming in. Um, so we um, presumably oversize our air conditioning plant quite a lot, because <laughs> the air's going to be way hotter when it comes in than we thought it was. Uh, but we can avoid all that if we were to get the landscape uh, better, you know, green, you know, that's what we want. Um, all right, we're not going to be ecologists ourselves, but we're going to work with people who can do that. 
Um, and, I'll, and obviously any air inlets, we, we don't want them down here, we maybe want them on the roof. But then again, you've got to make sure your roof doesn't get hot, you see. So you've got to try and pull air into the building that's cool to start with. Now, look at these tables. I'll, I'll just take you through very briefly. Um, it, what, what's clear is that hot climates are not always hot, and the conditions vary. <coughs> Sometimes the requirements contradict. Chicago is classic, isn't it? I mean, Chicago is really cold in winter, coming in ice, and in summer it's uh, hot. So they contradict each other. So how are you going to deal with that? So you have to prioritise and try and see what the important issues are and how to, to deal with those. You want to look at the severity and duration of climatic factors. Uh, on this particular point here, there's, there's a paper I've got which is saying, and this is this particular writer's idea, if you are designing a building and you work out that it needs air conditioning for nine days a year, and the other, the other day is all right, you wouldn't do it. You would just say to the client, it's not worth doing. You, know, you don't want to pay for all this air conditioning equipment if you're going to run it for nine days. So for nine days, you're going to be a bit too hot, get some complaints, but that's it. So of course, with our simulation data these days, IES and the different simulation models we've got, we can predict exactly which days they're going to be and how long in that day. So on a, on a hot day, we might only be hot for four hours in the afternoon. So we go back to the client and say, well, if you want to be cool all the time, you've got to air condition. But it actually you could get away with it if you accept that nine days are going to be too hot. Now that's his number. So other times you might say to people, would be, you know, what, what's your criteria? So someone said to you, I'll accept one day or two days, uh, and you can do that. In the UK, in the hospitals, we, we say our hospitals are allowed to go over the peak temperature 80 hours. Not, not days, 80 hours. So it could be spread over a lot of time, or it could all occur on two days. But we could do an analysis and we can say uh, what the extreme would be. So that's another thing I've got, I've got to put in, because people have got to take that to their client. If you've got a client say, I never want this room to be above 21, you say, right, I'm going to air condition it. Sort of. But if you say to him, well, <clears throat> would you accept it going over for a few days a year? And it's important, by the way, that we get that defined as a brief. Otherwise, he's going to come back and blame us. So you're going to write down exactly what you mean. And by the way, my uh, climate data that I'm using is 2019, or it could be 2030 or 2050, because you get all this data from a computer and can feed it into your simulation files. And once you've done that, and that's the basis of your design, and he agrees with that, you, you can then work with him and say, yeah, I can design air conditioning to, to do that. Um, <coughs> when, when you look in here, it, um, the table two starts to look at comfort limits. So it's, it's saying that um, for these different humidity groups, you've got these different uh, criteria that you might accept. So that's a drier uh, period, this is, this is more humid. And what you might get during the nighttime and the daytime. Um, and, and with the average mean temperature in these ranges above here. So I'll show those in the guide. Uh, and then using that, <coughs> An analysis of the climate data for, say, Athens, you then work out uh, for each month of the year whether you're in these humid ranges or arid ranges, arid meaning low humidity, uh, and then work them out and, and uh, tick them in these boxes here. So this might be more of a Middle East country than, than Athens, or maybe, or maybe Colorado or somewhere like that, which is predominantly dry. So it's, it's never, it never gets humid in that place, but it's dry a lot of the time. So we've got a high scores here in the arid range. So now you're dealing with a place that there's, um, I mean, where evaporative cooling would be very effective, you see. <coughs> and then um, you go, using those indicators, you start looking under uh, particular areas like the layout of the building and there you're interested in, in how the buildings are spaced, whether they should be close together or with, with spaces in between or wide apart, how you're going to promote air movement through them. So you look at the predominant wind direction, 
um, and what kind of openings you're going to be able to get into that building to give you the airflows you want. Um, and then you might look at specific elements such as walls. So this is just an extract from, from this table. So you, you might put the wall, the roof, um, outdoor sleeping because this, is, this was residential that we were looking at here. And if you do get rain, how are you going to protect? Because in some of these tropical climates, the rain can be fairly concentrated into two or three months and not, not spread out. Um, in terms of looking at the openings, if you're naturally ventilating, you have to base the orientation on these factors here. One is the predominant breeze, which direction is the air coming from? If you've got the sea close by, it's going to come from that direction. Um, that's going to give you a cooling effect. Um, and then in, in the um, winter period, you're going to really want it towards the sun to allow some beneficial heating from solar gains. Moving beyond that, we would look at sustainable communities in here, I think, as well. And I've, um, I've got the diagram here from the BRE for uh, Brian communities, which looks at these, all these factors here. And, and this is something that I, I've applied on this project, which is Media City. This is it under construction, uh, and this is it finished. So, so Media City is where the, the BBC are in, just outside of Manchester, a place called Salford. Uh, it's, it's really quite good actually. You, you are visiting Manchester. Um, it's only, if you get the tram, it's only two or three stops out of the city centre. And it's, uh, it's all open like this. You can walk around and have a look. Um, it's got some museums. Well, all the museums in the UK are free by the way. Just wander and have a look. And the BBC are here, so there's um, quite a lot going on. There's also ITV and uh, filmmaking people. It's become a big digital area. Um, but it is actually a little city in its own right. There's a district energy scheme um, and it's, it's all data connected and uh, the rest of it. So, so the idea here was to get this to be excellent by thinking about all these things. The, the climate, the energy, the materials we use, the transport links, where the businesses could come and thrive. And of course, at the moment, you know, media is really the big thing. So there's very successful business here at all levels. The BBC are big, of course, but you've got lots of little companies who come and work for those. Um, we've got local communities, people live, work, play here, but there's also people living nearby who work here, so it's been very good for the community. The buildings themselves meet the Brian rating for a particular building, but this is more about how the whole lot works uh, as, as a big community. And in that, you've got the placemaking to think about and the ecology. So, you know, these spaces outside, do they work? For people um, and the ecology, the planting, the water, and the cooling, that kind of thing. So uh, that we, we got Brian excellent for that um, as a community. So just moving to the, the last bit of work I did was really trying to look at uh, existing buildings, and this was in Spain in Granada actually. And traditionally here in these kind of climates, we went for narrow streets so that the buildings shaded each other and they kept the sun away. In, in the winter, the obviously fairly heavy weight constructions, these overhanging balconies are giving quite a lot of shade as well, but they're also good for airflow routes through here. So, so the buildings and the way they were set out really started to act as a big thermal store to give you stability. Um, I mean, these go back four or five hundred years, I mean, buildings. Um, I was intrigued by the you know, coming back to this idea of sitting out in the sun, which people liked. Um, adjustable shading, so this, this is the waiter here and he's actually adjusting this. Um, so that is acceptable in those locations. You know, people, if we, if we point that out, um, the architect or someone can design those to uh, give that shading. Um, and we, we of course can do daylight and sunlight analysis you know, in our simulation tools now. Um, I, I think um, atriums they're, they're, they're great spaces actually, they look, they look great, but actually from an engineer's point of view it's a ventilation shaft and it also uh, is a daylight feature, it's bringing daylight down into the heart of the building and getting into these rooms. So we, we need to have a really strong say in, in how these atriums are designed. And, and I, I, when you mentioned the fire engineer before, that's really how I got into fire engineering, was I had to become the fire engineer for this, this building to show that the, this atrium would actually exhaust the building of smoke, um, which it will do. 
Um, natural ventilation, I've mentioned that. Um, this, this is a really, I think the best tool around at the moment is this guide to follow. It's got the methodology set out. Um, it, it goes into quite a lot of detail. Um, this is the building I mentioned before, and there's a couple of slides in here showing how this works. It's on a hillside location. So, so I really went, um, they're going to dig the hill out from here to get these buildings sunk into the hill. And I thought it might be easier just to go forward a, a short bit and actually create a gap under the building um, so that it, it could be ground coupled and the air could come in underneath. So the, the idea is the air comes in underneath these floors here, uh, up into the building through these elements and then up through the roof to outside. Um, so you can just see it here. <coughs> this, this little bit here, this little bit here. So what I'm saying is originally this building was back here. This was dug out. So we had a, a retaining wall, a uh, slab up to here. Um, retaining walls are expensive, of course. You've got a water, rainwater problem, of course, because water's trying to push through, so you've got to keep them waterproof. Uh, and all that kind of thing. But if you slip it forward, then suddenly this is not a retaining wall, it's just a wall. And this is a spare void underground where you can bring the air in along underneath the building. It's linking with the ground. So the ground is always about 10 to 15 degrees centigrade. That's the kind of temperature. It's all year round. So in the, in the summer, it pre-cools the air. In the winter, it preheats it. And then we brought the air in through openings into the building and then it came through the rooms and then up to the roof where it exhausted out of a, a bank there. So that's the example of ground coupling, if you like, using the void. Similar in a way to Coventry, but these are more linear. Uh, oh, sorry, there's a picture of it. So you can see how those spaces were used to uh, bring air through into the depth of the building. Um, now, we did all this using CFD modelling, which you can do these days. So if you have a a program like IES, the film modeling, it's got a, a feature on it where you can do um, natural ventilation air flows. Um, so you can look at how the air comes into the room, how it flows up through the room, out to outside, and what kind of temperatures you're going to get. And you can adjust the areas of openings to, to see how much air is going to come in and out. I, I think one useful bit of feedback I would give you on this, uh, one thing I learned is you, you should control the air in and out. So if we take this as a room, for example, and the air's coming in, let's say, under the window with some dampers there, I'm going to come in, that's great, and then it's going to go out, maybe through the ceiling, obviously not this ceiling, but an open grid ceiling, out to outside, and out there is an atrium. Um, I did wonder whether you needed dampers here before you go out into the atrium. So you control the air in here. Once it's in here, why not just let it go out? Um, and, and what I have found is you do you do need the control there and you need it here. And these two controls work in unison to make sure that airflow is right. If you don't have these dampers in, then it's quite difficult to really control this room on its own. You can open the, the, the dampers at the outlet, the window there, in this case on the floor, but you've got no control over what's happening here. The air can flow back and forth. So that's one bit of feedback I'll put in the guide. Uh, in my design, I had them in both places, but in one of the projects, there, there, was, a, there was a problem and the contractor didn't put them in here. Uh, he said, do we need them? I said, yeah, we need them. We didn't put them in. Um, and uh, those, those rooms are less easy to control than the other buildings where we control that inlet and out them. Okay. Uh, this is the central atrium space I'm talking about. <coughs> it's interesting, these spaces, because they're basically circulation spaces in a building but as I say we're we're seeing them as a, a ventilation shaft and daylight shaft but then they suddenly really get used become popular so they have theatres in here now and all this kind of stuff exhibition spaces so it, it, they become um, very useful and attractive spaces and the, the places where people tend to chill out in a building and meet each other um, so they, they work extremely well and I think we have to realize that all that is probably going to happen when when people see them. Um, they become multi-purpose spaces. 
but uh, <coughs> we, we've got to bear in mind all the time that our job is to um, make them work um, in terms of the, the air flows. Um, and finally, I'll just, I'll just write the time here. This is the Alhambra in Granada, which I thought was a masterpiece. Really. It's 500 years old. Uh, this is the Alhambra, and it, it works really well. Um, but they've got all the kind of things that we have been talking about. Local trees for shading around the building. So this is a little area of cool air. Uh, as the air enters the building, this piece have cooled it down. Um, the, the whole place is surrounded by soft landscape, gardens, farmland. So that limits that heat island effect. You know, this, this seven degrees C here, it, it's not going to be seven, it's going to be maybe one because this ground is absorbing the heat, the, the trees absorb the heat. So you've got cool air uh, to start with. That, that's a, a big advantage. The water can do the same thing, of course. Uh, they've got sheltered walkways through the building and they've also built these wind towers in which help to pull the air up through the building. Um, and then they've used um, shade and water. Again, that's always a, a cooling feature to have water around. Uh, and these are these are nice spaces, of course, so to, to have a walk and have a coffee or whatever. But it, essentially, the water is there as an evaporative cooling effect <coughs> in, in that climate. And this is coming back to a place where we uh, went to a, a restaurant and uh, this was even more uh, adventurous blinds that can be pulled. They're automated, of course, but they can pull these back and forth to allow people shade as the sun moves around. Um, I haven't seen anything like this before, but uh, obviously anything possible. Uh, and these are controlled by the, um, say the barmen, uh, waiters, I guess, the waiters who are giving out food. They, they keep an eye on this and they decide who needs shading and where. Um, so people are sat outside. Uh, and then uh, I suppose just uh, in conclusion, I, I think the other thing we're looking at now is, is trying to get our cooling from renewable sources. So we've just realized in the UK that we have all these canals that they built back in the Industrial Revolution. They're, uh, I say some of them um, are, not, are not been in good condition. <laughs> They've got clogged up with rubbish. So they're starting to clean them out um, and they're starting to use them, but um, they, they can also use them a, as a source of heating or cooling. So with heat pumps, you can uh, take heat pump out of these canals or put heat back in because they're, they go hundreds of miles. You know. it's, it's a big uh, source of energy that we can uh, tap into. And the idea of doing that, of course, is with the heat pumps, if we're going towards a decarbonised grid, you know, with wind power generating electricity or nuclear, um, then we've, we've got uh, zero carbon cooling with that heat pump and that canal. So I, I think in conclusion, the hot climate guide is going to deal with hot dry, predominantly, uh, and hot temperate climates. I, I didn't really want to overlap into the hot unit one because that is already written. Um, I'm going to integrate passive solar with the HVAC systems. Um, and it may be that it's a situation where we switch one on and then the other, or we can work in a hybrid way where the two work together, as I showed you on that Judson College. And there's other ways of doing that. Uh, we've got a committee which is up and running. Uh, well, the target publication was 18, it's, it's the back of my brain. Um, got these workshops in progress. If you want to contribute, you're, you're very welcome. Just make contact with me uh, and see if there's anything you can add in. Um, I've got a bibliography coming together. That's quite short, obviously, but there's a lot more in the material. But if, if any of you have any uh, reference material that you think I should add in, just send me that. I will, will add it in. I, I think people like you know, to have references in, in a document like this at the back. You know, all the source information uh, that can be helpful, they, they want to have a look for it. So they go to the guide, and at the back they look for any information you guys have got, any research that you know of, just send it my way. But it doesn't have to be Nazare standard or no, no, anything. Standard. anything. Yeah, right. It could so be. There are a few standards from Germany, like the VDI, the yeah. EN. 
2089, which is exposed specifically for hot and humid climate, such as indoor swimming pools, and, so and goes further than that. Yeah, no, that'd be great. That one would be good. Um, but it could be a university research PhD that's been done. Um, so if you know someone who's doing a PhD research paper, um, just let me know and I'll reference it. Because some, somebody might want to go to that for more information. Okay. Got, uh, got five minutes for questions or comments? Yes, sir. Using the uh, face changing materials, if you want to maintain a room at the ground, let's say uh, 23 degrees, yeah. how much cooler does the material have to be? And how much cooler than that does the air uh, have to be to freeze it? Um, well, <coughs> if you've got phase change at, at 23, say, that should hold the room at 23, because as the air is going up, this is going to absorb energy at 23, because that's its melting temperature. So the, the room temperature would be, well, be 23. Yeah. It's going to reach 23 for that to happen. Um, to freeze it, you, you've got to be below. So if your outside temperature is 15, which it would be in the UK in summer, uh, we would allow that air to flow in, uh, and that would refreeze it at night. And you can refreeze it using a mechanical system, of course. Yes, so of course. Why would you do that? Well, if you had, say, a fan coil in the ceiling, and you blew cool air, you could refreeze it at 13 or 14 degrees C. And you would, you would do that because um, it's much lower energy to run your cooling at night. So th there's an argument for um, cooling down the structure and the phase change material using cheap night energy. And of course, your chilling system would be more effective at night because the outside temperature is cool. And the next day, you move into a passive mode rather than trying to run chillers, you know, when the outside temperature is 40, you run them last night when the temperature is 15. So you're, you're using your phase change to shift the load, you know. Uh, so, so, so one example of that in the UK is uh, instead of having two chillers in the building, you might have one chiller and, and one thermal store, which could be chilled water, or it could be chilled water with phase change material. But we've got, we got phase change at six, so we put that in a big vessel, and then you cool this at night, you run your chiller at night, and cool this vessel down, so the next day you've got all this chilled water sat there that you can cool. Um, if, if you hit a peak during the day and this is running out, you can bring your chiller back on because it's sat there. But it won't work as effectively during the day because it's dealing with outside temperatures that are higher. So you, we were thinking really in terms of shifting that. And of course this fits in well with the renewables because if you look at the, the grid, um, the carbon is lower at night because the wind turbines are blowing. But of course no one really wants much electric at night or in bed. So you could use electricity. So, so this is where we're going with this term smart grid. You know, the smart grid is saying this is a good time for you know, low carbon electricity, it's free. Nobody wants it, what are we going to do? So we need to put it into storage. So we have stores which could be cool water, could be hot water I suppose, um, in order to shift the loads. So, so we, we in the UK, we've grown up with this idea that when we want power, plug in, we're going to get it now. And at the other end of that is a big power station that's banging away, producing electricity because we might want to plug in. <laughs> and uh, we have a lot of standing losses with that, put in running losses. Um, we're moving away from that to, to be a bit smarter. This is where the energy is available. We need to get it, we need to hold on to it, and then we want to use it when we need it. You know? So it's a, a question of this smart grid coming in. Um, and that'll, that'll take some time, of course. But at the end of that, we, you know, we're at the, at the end of the line. We're doing the building. How can our building relate to that smart grid? Um, I mean, I, I'm I'm not over key myself on a net zero carbon building being standalone. I mean, if you try to do it on your own building, you put a lot of stuff on that costs a lot of money. It doesn't always work well. So I think you can put you can do so much, but you really need, you know, probably. If you take a wind turbine example, you need, you need it stood in the sea. You don't need it stood on the land. It doesn't work well on the land. It doesn't work very well in the building either. So you want to put the renewables in the right place. 
and then build your buildings to, to suit that. So it's uh, interesting challenges coming, but as you said, engineering problems, we can, we can solve those. Too many challenges. Too many challenges. We have to solve them one by one. That's right, yeah. Sometimes I like to solve two ones because that's integrated design then. <laughs> that's my the idea with the, the the void under the buildings. I thought the structural engineer's got to put in a a, a diaphragm wall. It's expensive, but I tell you what, if I tell him he, if he creates a void for me, that could be a, a cheaper wall, and then I've got a void. That's integrated design, isn't it? <laughs> The atrium is integrated design because it's doing, it's doing ventilation, it's doing lighting, uh, it's doing smoke control, and it's also a great space for people to use. So that's a good integrated design solution. But you're right, you know, each, each one of these things are challenging. If we get all right, then we, we're winning. <laughs> but it's an interesting time. Okay, I think we're on time now. Yes, we are. Thank you. That's a nice lunch. Thank you very much. Thanks for the man. Thank you very much.